back in June, I interviewed economist Mark Jackard from uh, Simon Fraser University about a, a study that he had co-authored in which he, it was about the Canadian electricity system and uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in it. And he talked about two pieces of federal legislation that the uh, federal government was using to reduce emissions. And I wondered when I heard uh, Justin Trudeau's speech yesterday at COP about capping oil and gas emissions, if that same legislation would work in this case. Well, I'm going to talk to Mark Jackard about that. So welcome to the interview, Mark. Happy to be here. Well, look, first of all, uh, what are the two pieces of legislation and do you think they'll work in this context? Right. So just before identifying them, I'll say that um, energy in our constitution is really provincial jurisdiction and our courts have strongly recommend you know have strongly endorsed that and uh, and our governments and so when you're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions there the courts have said oh federal government uh, does have authority especially because it's got to go out and negotiate international agreements because this is a global problem so i pointed out in that uh discussion with you about electricity that um, really the two pieces of legislation that are dominant now at a federal level are the Canadian Environmental Protection Act because environment is a federal provincial jurisdiction so the federal government can say under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act we set regulations and the courts have agreed that uh, carbon dioxide the primary greenhouse gas is a pollutant under the act and therefore we can regulate it as a pollutant. So the federal government can't necessarily try, I don't know if the courts would let them try to regulate the production of oil sands, like how many barrels are you allowed to produce? And, and I wouldn't want them to. to. I agree with the Canadian constitution, it's provincial jurisdiction, but the federal government could say, um, we're only gonna allow you to produce this much emissions from the oil sands. And it could be that under that scenario, your own innovations and market prices enable you to actually increase production while your emissions go down perhaps even all the way down to zero. So that's the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And the other one is simply the one that just um, made it through the, the Supreme Court this January, which is the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, uh, which was challenged by Alberta, Ontario, Saskatchewan, maybe others. And the courts said, no, the federal government can do that. And again, the logic is very similar. In other words, the logic is the federal government's putting a price on pollution it's not putting a price on energy. It's not interfering in energy policy at the provincial level or ownership or, and so on. So those are the two pieces, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act and the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. Well, let's talk about uh, carbon pricing first, because I don't think a lot of viewers understand that under the industrial emitters program, especially in Alberta, uh, there is actually, under, through their output-based allocation system, the industrial emitters get a discount. They get an 80 or 90% discount from whatever the carbon price is. So if your carbon price is uh, $50 a ton, you're only paying 40 or four, you're getting a 40 or $45 discount. Uh, discount, and I would imagine that the government, federal government, could come in and say, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna shut that down. We're gonna lower that discount over time, so you you get the full price of the uh, of the uh, carbon price uh, quicker." Yes, and so, and the discount, you know, is justified for steel production, cement production, oil production on a global level because our oil producers, steel producers, cement producers are competing with countries from around the world, uh, with producers from around the world in countries that could be climate laggards and aren't putting that price or regulating. So Alberta innovated that policy in about 2005 and we have different incarnations of it and now even a federal one. And I think it's a really good policy, but you're right, what you can do, so, so the policy, only prices a percentage of the emissions. So let's say, I'll make it up, 20%, 15%. It does that because that at least gives you the incentive to reduce emissions because you'll save the money on the first emissions you reduce. Um, and at the same time, it doesn't jack up your cost of production, which wipes you out when competing with, again, the laggards, the industries from laggard countries. But you're, so, you know, you pointed out the federal government could just say, well, we'll put the price on every ton you emit. Well, guess what? They wouldn't even need to do that. <laughs> like to hit a cap, 
on emissions, they could they probably can start rising it just a little bit. And then if I were them, I would also give some subsidies to the industry. Like I would use that money to give back. So um, because you don't want the so you want to really incentivize that the emissions are capped going down. Um, but you don't want to put them out of business. So you are going to have to, um, until we have a global system of carbon tariffs, then you wouldn't need this. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to be careful how you implement that. But, and as a, the, you and I are talking about pricing. I'm a, I, I run an energy economy model. I try to tell governments, here's what the emissions will be from oil and gas or oil or whatever, once you put this price on, but it's, it's highly uncertain. I hate to say it, but my model's uncertain. If you do it as a regulation, uh, then we can be more certain about the outcome. Okay, so when we, we know that they have an option on the carbon pricing side. How would this work on the uh, uh, CEPA uh, and you know, if they were going to regulate uh, emission levels? Right, so, and uh, as, as I've told you at other occasions, um, I'm always careful here because I'm not a lawyer and I'm not even an expert on these kind of laws. I study them, I read them, I talk about them with lawyers and try to learn from that. Um, so I'm speculating a bit here, but I, I think it's pretty accurate because it's kind of what we've seen before. And that would be that you'd say, you know what, every single plant, um, we're actually just gonna cap your emissions or every firm but probably every plant, every facility, we're gonna cap your emissions. And by the way, so we're putting a cap on them and um, we're gonna uh, let it, um, we're gonna make it decline. Like five years from now, it's 2% lower and da, 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 da. And then you as a firm can go ahead and trade with other firms if they can do it more cheaply. So what does that sound like? Well, that sounds like cap and trade, which is another form of carbon pricing. So if you make a regulation that enables those who are subject to the regulation to trade with each other, you're moving into this gray area, like, is it a carbon price or is it a regulation? And quite frankly, I don't care. And I don't think anybody should care, but it's, this is a, a, a problem that bedevils the writers like me who are on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, because we, We've been fighting about this for two years now. Like, is this a regulation? Is this carbon pricing? So there's my answer is you can set a regulation under SEPA about emissions from a facility. Uh, you could do it per ton of production, but then you're running into that problem where if the production rises fast enough, then Justin Trudeau, you've not capped emissions. They're actually going to rise as well. And we've seen that before. So that's why a performance standard, that's emissions per ton of output, is not guaranteeing this cap that Trudeau just announced. You guarantee the cap by actually making it an absolute cap, not per ton produced, and then declining over time. But again, you could allow trading. Now, Mark, you, you advise governments on policy. And, and uh, so you're sitting there as an advisor to uh, the Alberta government or the federal government. And you know that the uh, oil sands make up 75%, 80% of Canadian oil production. And these are big industrial operations. They, do, they are the proverbial super tanker that doesn't turn on a dime. And the prime minister has said, we're capping it today and reducing emissions tomorrow. So he obviously has, you know, a fairly short time. They're not going to be a long, given a long, you know, years to to prepare for this. What do the what do the uh, what does the industry do? Right. So depends uh, how you define today and tomorrow, <laughs> because um, I remember when you said we're doing a clean fuel standard today, and it'll be pretty tough tomorrow. So. Um, I'm more worried on the other side, Markham. I'm, I'm more worried that they would negotiate this for 10 years. In fact, you talk about me advising governments. I remember doing that with the Kretchen government and the years ticked by. So I'm happy that he said today and tomorrow. And I'm worried, though, that it's rhetoric. In terms of the industry, you know, what he has said is that we're going to hit this 2030 target. So over here, you have this 2030 target. It's like a 40% reduction of national emissions. Well, oil, oil, oil and gas, I think emissions are about a quarter of Canadian emissions. I've kind of estimated that if you could get those down, um, if you could get those down 
10%, max 15% by the year 2030. That and instead of them growing, that, that really makes it more achievable to get that target. So just think what I'm saying. That's, let's say 10, let's say 15%, just make that number up between over the next nine years to 2030. If the industry's output is not growing anymore and global markets and you know, investment cycles have kind of made it so the output is probably not going to, there's not a lot of pressure for output to grow. In, and the industry keeps telling us we've come up with this new innovation and this new innovation that is capturing carbon, that is making um, each, each production process more efficient, um, then I don't see that as a huge stretch. First of all, I think industry can absorb that kind of reduction in terms of their cost structure. And then I think where they're doing some really new innovative stuff, yes, the feds and the provincial government have to step in and help with the costs. And they've been doing that. So there's some projects coming out. I can't, I can't name them all. So that would be my... Um, that would be my take on it. It's not as draconian and urgent as the language might make one feel. Now, final question, Mark. I'm curious uh, for your take on this. Um, the uh, five uh, big oil sands companies have all put out their investor presentations uh, not that many months ago. And of them, Suncor is the only one that uh, has promised to reduce emissions before 2030. And they're gonna reduce it by a, a fair amount actually. And what they've done is taken a very different approach. They said, we are not going to grow volume. We're just gonna cap it at 800,000 barrels a day. We're going to improve our value. We're gonna bring our cost per barrel down from $35 to $28. That's how we're going to define growth for our investors. And that is what, and then we're going to invest in things like cogeneration and you know solvent substitution and all kinds. It's a very different model. This is we've not we've never seen this as a deliberate strategy out of the oil sands. Nobody else is doing it. And I wonder if enough pressure was put on the other companies, the CNRLs and the Synovus and Imperial Oil and so on, if they might go, hang on a second, maybe we should try that approach uh, because we're actually get then we get our emissions down and we also maintain our profitability. Absolutely, and, and this, is not, this is not new. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, as a strategy, just, just think of OPEC um, OP, or, or Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia produces about 10 million barrels a day. It, it jumps up and down, but over the decades, and we've always noticed they could do double that. And they basically said, no, you know, if we're at 20 million barrels a day, Probably governments in the West will try to, you know, keep us out of the market. They won't like it. They'll feel too vulnerable. So we're going to limit ourselves for whatever reasons. And then we're going to try to get more value added. We're going to try to lower our costs. I don't think they've been very good at that. But we're also going to do refining. We're going to try to get value added from the resource that we're developing. And so, um, and I think that's obviously what can happen, and I would argue should happen, uh, in um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, in fossil fuel endowed regions around the world. It's recognized that humanity is trying to move away from the combustion, the burning of gasoline and diesel in cars, but you could still get value from fossil fuels. And that's why 15 years ago, I wrote a book called Sustainable Fossil Fuels, in which I was just pointing out that when humanity finally says greenhouse gas emissions must stop and then decline, it doesn't spell the death knell for regions that are rich in fossil fuels, if they're smart and creative. And you just gave an example of that. Well, Mark, always appreciate your insights. Thank you very much for this. It's been my pleasure, Mark. I'm happy to do it.